Thank you so much, and the Lord bless you. Love you. Thank you. You may be seated. What a joy it is for my wife and uh, me to come to, and be again with you at Christ's Gospel. I didn't introduce my wife, Jewel, this morning. We've been married almost 49 years. So, Jewel, would you stand and everybody uh, can see you? When I graduated from seminary, I was still single, and I came back uh, to a teaching position at, a, at Evangel College, now Evangel University, and uh, my first Sunday back in my home church, Central Assembly in Springfield, Missouri, I was sitting near the back, it was a long sanctuary, and I noticed up in the choir a gal I'd gone to college with but never dated because she was out of my league. And um, she was too pretty to go out with a mutt like me. So I, we found each other after church and began talking, and this went on for about six weeks. We'd talk at the back of the church after the service was out, and Finally, the custodian would shoo us out into the parking lot. We'd talk some more, and she'd get in her two-tone green Ford, 55 Ford, and drive away. And I was saying to myself, boy, I'd sure like to ask her out, but she'll never go out with me. And she was thinking, when's this guy going to ask me out? He sounds interested. <laughs> so our first date was October 16th, 1965. I asked her to marry me October 30th, 1965. <laughs> And we were married December 27th, 1965. So, once you get over your shyness, you can make some time. I love coming to Christ's gospel. I love everything about Christ's gospel. I love the Christ of Christ's gospel. I treasure the presence of the Lord here. You seek his presence. So many churches today are just rushing through a program. You take time to rejoice in the Lord, to wait upon the Lord, to pray, to lift your hearts and to lift your hands. I don't know if you realize what an oasis you have here at Christ's Gospel. Well, I can tell you it is a spiritual oasis for me every time I come. I love your pastor, Bernice Hicks. What a woman of God she is. Amen. And uh, and, if, and I know she likes humor, so she'll forgive me for this, but when I was here several years ago, I was deeply disturbed because she felt that maybe that was her last year. And I remember that I was wrestling with that, and Sunday night when I stood up to minister, I said, you know, I know she feels that way, but... You know, you're a praying church, and you can pray against that. And, uh, and you won. And she's here. Going strong. And so she sets the bar in hospitality in every way. She loves the Lord with all her heart and has plumbed the depths of his word. And then every element of the service, this marvelous band and horn and saxophone and violin and the soloist and the choir and... And then I, I think I would come also just to hear Alan take the offering. I mean, he, he, is, though, he is so thoughtful. The best, the best thoughtfulness of taking an offering in any church I've been, he should make a book of his offering appeals and, and give it to you. I suggest that. But it's marvelous. Everything is just so wonderful about being at Christ's Gospel. And it's just a thrill for my wife um, and I to come here this evening and uh, this morning as well, and this weekend, and be with you. Um, all right, let's dive into the Word. Let me ask you a question, and I'll probably embarrass you uh, with your, because I know this is a biblically knowledgeable congregation, but let's see if you know this. <laughs> if I asked you this question, do you think the Bible emphasizes most the word remember or the word forget? Okay, let's limit it to the New Testament for a moment. Do you think the New Testament limits it most to the word remember or the word forget? What say ye? Oh, I'm so sorry that most of you answered it wrong. The word remember, memory, remembrance, those words, cognate words associated with the word remember occurs 72 times in the New Testament. The words forget, forgetting, and forgotten occur 10 times. And six of those 10 times we are told not to forget. 
And that's very meaningful to me because as you get older, you tend to forget. I sometimes compare my mind to a Swiss cheese that's full of holes. Stuff keeps falling out of it. So I'm trying to remember. And of course, that word remember is very important to me when I come to Jeffersonville. I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. I talked some about it this morning. And if we had an unlimited amount of time, I could take you through all 72 occurrences of the word remember. But I don't think I'll do that. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Instead, I'm going to focus on the two things, two of the things that we are told to remember and two of the things that God remembers. First, the two things that we are told to remember. First, from Matthew chapter 16 and verse 9. Matthew 16 verse 9. Do you not yet understand, nor remember, the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Don't you remember, Jesus tells the disciples, that I am able. Don't you remember what happened when the little boy gave his lunch? Don't you remember that I can start with small things and make great things? One of the dangers of the Christian life is that we can so easily forget what God has done for us in the past. And when we get into a new situation, maybe a different situation like the disciples found themselves here, we fail to transfer the memory of the past, how God has brought us through with the need of the present. And Jesus wants us to remember that he is able. That no matter what circumstance you're in today, when you look at his past favor, his past grace, his past goodness to you, it is not something that was limited to that moment of time. It is from day unto day, from morning until evening, without ceasing, the love of God for you never ceases. Remember, remember, remember what God has done for you. I remember also how he starts with very small things. And so often we don't recognize that God is doing something when it is in seedling stage. But everything in the kingdom of God, just like in the natural order, begins with small. Begins with a seed. Whether it's the expansion of the gospel in the New Testament with the birth of the, uh, the conversion of the first Gentile, the Ethiopian eunuch, and then the conversion of a family, Cornelius' family, didn't look like much was happening, didn't look like hardly a ripple on the water, but already the gospel was inching out of its all Judaic background. Ethiopian eunuch, uh, a family, and then up to Antioch in a Gentile city, and before you know it, it spread throughout the world. Don't you remember, God was in all those steps. Yeah. Don't you remember Chestnut and Graham at Jeffersonville? Most of you were not there. I was there. I was there when there were 15 to 20 people on a good Sunday. And I was the one who is a shy 13-year-old, 14-year-old, and 15-year-old taught the fourth and fifth graders because we had a one-room Sunday school with slat benches that were movable. And you move the next to the last bench in the far back left-hand side because there were four Sunday school classes and the two benches needed to face one another with the four and five-year-olds and I was the teacher of the four and five-year-olds. And my job was to keep those kids quiet for 45 minutes so the other classes could function. And I did that, don't you remember, with flannel graph, whoever heard of flannel graph in this digital age, with flannel graph and with a shoebox during the week with which I would paste in, stick up figures, Bible figures, and if the kids were good, at the end of the Sunday school class, they could look through the people and see the three-dimensional characters. I remember that. And I remember how shy I was as a kid because at the age of 10 I had a chipped tooth right in the center of my mouth in the upper palate and my folks really didn't feel they had enough money to get it fixed until I was fully grown. So while I was in Jeffersonville I had a, I had a chipped tooth in the center of my mouth which meant that I didn't like to smile because I looked so goofy and besides I had a freckled face that looked like a pepperoni pizza and unruly red hair. Uh, that hair is coming back in the resurrection. I believe I will have hair in the resurrection. In fact, I have a private view of the resurrection. I don't know if it's right or not, but it's when Jesus says that uh, we shall be like him. He uh, rose, rose again from the dead at 33. I figure I'm going to be rolled back, and if you die before then, you're going to be rolled forward. That's just my private view. It's not doctrine, okay? 
But I remember how I had a call to the ministry. And anybody that would have looked at me that time except my mother would have said, this kid can never make it because he's so shy, he can't get up before a group and even talk because he's so self-conscious. And I used to say, and I still say to some, some days, I, I've lifelong suffered from an inferiority complex. And one of my best friends said, George, you don't have an inferiority complex, you're just inferior. <laughs> With friends like that, you know, what can you do? But I remember that. And who would have guessed 60 years ago, looking at that 13-year-old boy, that someday that 13-year-old boy would be a general superintendent of a movement that has 67 and a half million people around the world. It's just I look at the grace of God, and I am stunned. And on the days when I feel like I don't amount to anything, and that I'm not going fast enough, and I'm doing, not doing enough for the Lord, I remember his goodness. And I remember that he took a person like me, disqualified in every respect, and did something with my life. And I remember also that he took an orphan girl out of the orphanage in Kentucky and brought her to be pastor of Christ's gospel and lead this great international movement. God is able. God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise. And he's still doing it today. And you may be facing at this juncture in your life some difficult circumstance. But I know this is a seasoned spiritual audience who has been enriched by not only the milk of God's word, but by the meat of God's word. And I know if I can stimulate your memory to recall what God has done in your life in the past, that it will give you courage and faith to believe in what you're facing in this moment and in all the moments to come. So do not forget. Do not forget what God has done for you in the past. And do what Jesus says. Remember the loaves and how he took Five, uh, five pieces of bread and two fish. Yeah. Then, the second thing that we are to remember is, uh, to me, stunning. I, I wouldn't expect to find it in the New Testament at all because it is Christianity 101. It's the kind of thing that we so take for granted that no one should tell us to remember it because it should always be on our mind. Paul, writing from a prison cell in his last letter, 2 Timothy, tells Timothy to remember this. And it, to me, is absolutely stunning. Remember, he says, remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David raised from the dead. How could you ever forget that? It's the very floor of our faith. Jesus is risen. People ask me theological questions and like, why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Why do you believe in, uh, for example, in the sexual revolution? Why do you believe the way Christians believe about morality? And my answer is very similar, s simple. It's Jesus has authority to speak into our life. And I will trust the words of someone who has risen from the dead because no one else has done it. No one else has done it. And as I heard this week, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Obama health care. Jesus has got a better plan. It's called eternal health care, and it's free because he's risen from the dead. Remember, Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And I've lived long enough and have had family experiences that have taught me that in enduring ways. My uncle, Victor Plymeyer, was a pioneer missionary to northwest China and Tibet. He went to Northwest China and Tibet in the year 1908. He served, in fact, 16 years before he had made his first Tibetan convert. He had a long-distance courtship with his wife in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Long-distance because in those days it took about three months to get a letter from Northwest China all the way to, uh, to Pennsylvania and then to get an answer back. In fact, one of the, my distinct memories of childhood was my mother reading a letter that had come telling her of her own mother's death that had happened uh, weeks earlier. And my mother crying in the courtyard. It was the days before internet and long distance telephone and communication was slow. And he was up there isolated 
at about a 10,000 foot altitude in a border town uh, called uh, Huang Yan. Its uh, Tibetan name was Tangar. It had both Chinese and Tibetans in the town. And after 12 years of courtship, he came home, married his sweetheart. A year later, a baby boy was born. They took that baby back to Huang Yan, high up in the Qinghai Mountains. And that first winter, it's bitter cold at 10,000 feet. That first winter, it was very bitter cold. They managed to rent a two-bedroom apartment with dirt floors with a little toddler on those floors. Terribly cold, no fresh fruit, no fresh vegetables. And they stuck it out through that long, hard winter. At the end of that winter, my uncle said to his wife, Grace, I found a plot of ground on which we could, we could buy and we could build a church and a house in back of it but it, it will cost us uh, $5,000. That in uh, the year 1921, 22 was a lot of money. And he said, we, oh, our support is only $50 a month as missionaries. I don't know how we would get that. And she said, well, Victor, when I, uh, before I was married, I received an inheritance of $5,000. And I would like to give that $5,000 uh, for this. And he said, I cannot ask you to spend your inheritance for this. She said, how can we say we love the lost if we're not willing to give our all? So they took that $5,000, bought the property, built the chapel and the house in back of it, which stand to this day. Now, in American Christian life, often it is represented that if you do something noble for God, he then turns back and does something splendid for you. It's the uh, put a dollar in the plate and expect five dollars back. It's what you hear often on Christian television. Send me a hundred dollars and a blessing pact and God will bless you. I want to say to that TV preacher, if you really believe that, you send me a hundred dollars and see. But anyway, that's just my cynical nature, okay? I hope I'm not transgressing on anything here. I get a little bit upset with these charlatans. But that did not happen. In January 1927, when John David was six years of age, he came down with smallpox, a deadly disease. And a week later, Grace came down with smallpox. And my uncle would shuttle back and forth between their rooms, taking care of them. And John David was so sick, but he loved to hear the Bible stories of David and Daniel and Jesus. And his last words were, Daddy, Jesus is coming for me. Um, Grace was so sick that my uncle did not have the ability to go out and arrange for a burial in the cemetery, so instead he dug a temporary shallow grave in the courtyard between the church and the house, and with his wife standing in the doorway, conducted the funeral service himself. A week later, he and his wife are having their devotions in the morning at their, bed, at their bedside. She is very ill. They sing a hymn together, and when they have finished singing that hymn, her head slumps on his shoulder, and she too had gone into the presence of the Lord. In one week's time, he had lost his wife and his child. He went to the town authorities and sought permission to, to, uh, from the town authorities to have a plot in the town cemetery. But there was a lot of anti-foreign feeling and they declined to give him a plot. So outside the town, he found a plot of ground overlooking a Tibetan hillside. He bought the plot and he buried his wife and child there. I've stood at that grave many times as an adult in recent years. Just a simple mound of dirt, never had a grave marker. It was just simply there as a silent witness. It was bitter cold that January and my uncle lasted then through the next months of winter and when spring began to break in April and May, he determined that he would do what no one had ever done before and that is cross Tibet from China to India with gospel literature distribution. He had 100,000 copies of the Gospel of John printed, loaded them on yak pack animals and set out in the late, in late May of 1927. The last day he was in Huang Yan, he went out to the grave, he took his journal with him, and he wrote these words in his journal. Until the last nook and corner of Tibet has reached 
has been reached by the gospel, until every last man, woman, boy, and girl has heard the story of redemption through Jesus Christ, my task is not done. And he set out. For the next nine months, he would traverse through Tibet. His life was nearly lost twice, saved through intercessory prayer of God revealing specific pictures of him in Tibet in danger to persons here in the United States who prayed for him in intercessory prayer. He emerged on the India side nine months later and his support of $50 a month was still holding so instead of coming back to America he circled back through India on back through China a year and a half later met my mother and her sister married my mother's sister came back to Wang Yan and our mission station was 30 miles from him when I was a child and we all served faithfully until 1949 our two families came out together on the back of a flatbed truck. I was eight years of age. Came out for two days on the back of a flatbed truck down a winding dirt mountain road, hugging a mountain gorge, made it to an airstrip, flew out over communist lines, and came home. My parents and my aunt and uncle longed to go back and longed to know what happened to their beloved churches. But no word ever came out and no word ever got through it was dangerous, in fact, for either family to contact the Christians because the Christians then would be only accused of being in league with CIA spies, which is what the communists labeled the missionaries. It looked like, for all practical purposes, that the work would die. The persecution under Mao Zedong was fierce, and he sought to eradicate the church, sought to eradicate the Bible. Finally, in 1988, the door opened again to that region. My cousin, who is a lifelong missionary, who is the son of Victor and Ruth, my aunt, got back in first, and a few months later, I came back in with him. We went back to the towns where our parents had labored. We came back to Huang Yan and met Pastor Chin. Pastor Chin's father was the pastor that Uncle Victor had left in charge of the work, but he had died as a martyr for the gospel in a labor camp. His son, Pastor Chin, had been on the run, hiding out for eight years, separated from his family in village after village as he tried to stay alive. He had now come back. He went to the government, the local government, because China policy was changing and was allowing churches to reclaim their property. And he said to the local government, the Christian church in this town has property. I would like to reopen the church. I am Pastor Chin. They said to him, you have no proof that that property was ever a church, even though clearly it is visibly a church, even though clearly it is on the main road, and even though clearly everyone in that town knew its history, because it's a relatively small town of about 30,000. So when we met Pastor Chin again, he was working as a guard in a vinegar factor, factory, unable, can you imagine that? A guard in a vinegar factory. I wonder what in the world is a vinegar factory need a guard for, but I guess there's precious product there in a vinegar factory. <laughs> And I, uh, he said, uh, he said I, we, have no, we have no proof. We cannot get the church back. We have no title deed. He said to my cousin David, he said, uh, by any chance, would you know if your dad had a deed to this property? David said, I don't know. We've never talked about that. But when I get back to the United States and look in the files of our Assemblies of God World Missions Department into my father's file, I will see if I can find anything. David came back to America, looked in his father's file, and there was a deed, but not a deed to the church. It was a deed to the grave out on the edge of town. And my uncle, when he took that property, even though it was a personal grave, did not put the grave deed in his own name. He put it in the name of the church, the Gospel Hall of Wang Yan. David took that deed back to Pastor Chin. Pastor Chin took it to the authorities and said, we have a deed. It is a deed to the grave out on the edge of town that proves that we exist as a church. Please return the property. And they did. And the church reopened and is a church that is bearing the light of the gospel today in that remote corner of the world. Several years later, after we had helped with humanitarian projects which had helped to further open the hearts of people and my cousin was made an honorary citizen of Qinghai Ching, province and we were covered by local media 
for helping equip the hospital in their town. The citizens, the, especially the leadership, the communist leadership of that town, noticed that the hillside was eroding where the grave was. And so they said, we're very concerned that the day may come when the caskets will spill out into the valley. We would like to offer the church a new cemetery, and we would like at our expense to relocate your graves. So the day came when they exhumed the grave. The grave diggers began digging. They got down to six feet, and there were no caskets. They finally got down to nine feet and found the boy's casket on top of his mother's casket. My uncle had buried them so deeply because he was concerned about grave robbers. So he buried them far in the cold, hard soil of a January winter in Huang Yan. He had buried them deeply. We went, or my family, I wasn't there at that occasion, I came later, went up to the mountainside, the new mountainside, the grave, and the Communist Party of Huang Yan had created a gravestone, a monument. The first time the grave had ever had a monument. And in Chinese and in English, they had a gospel poem and a scripture that said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that story is an anchor for me. Because sometimes when it looks like something is dead, it's not dead. It's like a potato, it's just underground. It's like a seedling, it's just underground. And Paul tells Timothy in a time when Rome is beginning to severely persecute the Christians, don't forget this reality. Don't forget, Jesus is Lord. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Let that be an anchor in your life. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what trials come, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. But because he is risen, we live also. And because he is risen, we also will enjoy the resurrection and eternal life through Christ. Don't forget that. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Well, let me talk about two things that the Lord remembers, not that he ever forgets anything, but it's interesting to read uh, these passages. Luke chapter 12, verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings or two pennies, and yet not one of them is forgotten of God. Not one of them is forgotten of God. If God remembers the sparrow, he remembers you. He has not forgotten you. God knows you individually. You are not just in a group of people. His love individualizes and particularizes on you. You know, that five sparrows is interesting because in another passage, I believe it's in, uh, uh, it's in Luke, uh, Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Here it's five sparrows for two pennies. And I've come up with my own interpretation of the difference. On one occasion, Jesus is saying, are not two sparrows sold for, sold for a penny and another five sparrows for two pennies? And what he is observing is two different things. The normal price for two sparrows is a penny, the smallest unit of currency. Because you can't, uh, you can't, uh, five sparrows, yeah, uh, two sparrows for a penny. So, so, you wouldn't want to just sell one sparrow because that's half a penny and that unit of currency doesn't exist. So two sparrows for a penny. But there was an enterprising bird seller out in the swap meet who said, I can sell more sparrows if I sell them in bulk and throw a fifth one in free. Everybody's in for a freebie. So the normal price is four sparrows for two pennies, but if you buy today, are not five sparrows for two pennies, you get the fifth one free. And I think that's the one that Jesus says, even the freebie that has no economic value of its own is remembered of God. It is not forgotten by God. You don't have to be rich to be remembered of God. And it doesn't bother him that you're poor because he's going to remember you rich or poor, red or yellow, black or white, you are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all his children in the world. I think I saw this in a powerful way with a pastor I had when I was a teenager in, in high school and in college in Springfield, Missouri. As a pastor I greatly admired. He was tall, probably about six foot four, wavy brown hair. He was not the greatest preacher in the world, not a great orator, but he was a fabulous pastor. And one of the marks of his pastoral care was that he never forgot a name. You meet him once and he always remembered your name. I've always wanted that gift and it's eluded me. 
<laughs> and I used to be really be bothered by the fact that it had eluded me, but then I read how Paul in Corinthians said, I baptize Stephanus and I baptize Gaius. Oh, and I don't know if I remember. I don't remember if I baptized anybody else. And I thought, oh, that saves me. If the Apostle Paul can't remember who he baptized, that's okay, you know. But um, Pastor McQueen, uh, after his service, um, resigned and ultimately retired and went to another state. I went on to become a pastor in California myself and I happened to be back in my home church in Missouri on a homecoming Sunday and Pastor McQueen had come back as it turned out it would be the last time I'd ever see him because shortly after that he went to be with the Lord. His brown hair was now uh, threaded with gray and he wasn't as tall as he used to be but he still had that magnificent smile and pastoral care. And everybody wanted to see him and greet him after the service. So there was a long line of people that were waiting to see him, and I was in that line. And the lines were coming from different directions. And then I saw an elderly couple whose name I do not know. I'll call them Bill and Mary because I did not know them. But they both had walkers. And they were literally one inch at a time plodding their way toward Pastor McQueen. And it was obvious as I watched them that they probably didn't make it to church very often anymore because it was just too slow moving. They, they just couldn't do it. But they wanted to see Pastor. And people noticed them, so they made way and they inched their way up to Pastor McQueen. And as they came near him, the little old man lifted up his head and he said, Pastor McQueen, you probably don't remember us. To which Pastor McQueen reached out both arms and encircled this couple and said, Oh, Bill and Mary, how could I ever forget you? And they both stood straight up. It's like our life has dignity and meaning. Our pastor still remembers our name. And that'll ever forever be etched in my mind as a representative of how God looks at us. He knows your name. He knows your name. And someday when we're in that receiving line in heaven and getting ready to meet Jesus for the first time, he's not going to look to his administrative assistant and say, oh, by the way, what's the name of the next person in line? He knows you. If he knows the fifth sparrow, he knows you. And then the other thing that God remembers is found in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. I shouldn't say God remembers, it's just that God doesn't forget. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. In other words, if God forgot your work, he would be unjust. It'd be unjust for him not to thank you. It'd be unjust for him not to recognize that you gave of yourself unstintingly to the Lord, that you gave the cup of cold water at his name, that you fed the hungry and clothed the naked and visited those who were in prison, that you did your best to represent him in this world, that you were part of his church, that you cared for one another, that you loved one another, that you supported his work, that you helped to spread the gospel throughout the whole world. He doesn't forget that. This church keeps good records and keeps good books, but I'll tell you the one who keeps the perfect record and the perfect book, and that is God, who does not forget what you have done. He remembers. He remembers. Two weeks from today, I'll be speaking for the 100th anniversary of a church in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. It's near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was founded in 1914 by a 24-year-old pastor named Ben Mahan. He had just recently been saved and baptized in the Spirit and called to be a minister. He had no formal training, but he had a call of God on his life. He would be a self-taught person uh, and, and a marvelous minister throughout his life. But in 1914, he came to Jeanette, Pennsylvania. He had no financial support. He had no, uh, uh, no organization behind him. The Assemblies of God was just being formed at that time. Christ's gospel had not yet been formed at that time. And not having any resources at all, he just simply 
took a spot on a public sidewalk on a Saturday night. It was the days before shopping malls when you can still to this day preach on a public sidewalk, but private malls are private and they have speech restrictions. But, but sidewalks are free speech. So he stood on the sidewalk and Saturday night when people were down shopping, he would hold an impromptu street meeting. People began coming to the Lord. Of course, some people walked the other side of the street. Some people ignored him. Some people ridiculed him. Some drunks made fun of him. But gradually, people began to find the Lord. And after a while, they moved into, um, they, wanted a, they wanted to meet a regular place, so not just on Saturday nights. So they rented the hall above the butcher shop on Clay Avenue, the main street of town. And then a few years after that, the congregation had grown and it bought the old Presbyterian church, which was up for sale, up higher on Clay Avenue and moved into it and packed it out. In that same town, there was a widow with four children. In fact, in 1910, four years before Ben Mahan came to town, her husband, at the age of 40, dropped dead of a heart attack, leaving her with a girl six, a girl four, a boy two, and a girl that was just a couple weeks old. It was in the days before Social Security. She had no means of support. She had no vocational abilities. She took in washings and ironings to try to make a living and keep her family together. But it was tough going. And a few years after her husband John died, she married a widower who had six children. I don't know that they married so much for love as to provide a parent for their children. What she didn't know about her new husband, and she was not a believer at the time, what she did not know about him is that when he drank, he became verbally and physically abusive. And he especially did not like her son. So when that boy was in the fifth grade, the stepfather put him in the glass factory working the three to 11 o'clock shift. He had to take the fifth grade twice. The teacher would let him sleep in the closet because he was so tired during the daytime. When he was in the eighth grade, the stepdad showed up at school, pulled him out of school, gave him a long pair of pants, and put him to work in the glass factory working the midnight to early morning shift. And by the time that boy was 16, he was an angry young man using the courses of language and doing deeds that kids that are heading for a life of rebellion do in that era at 16 years of age. But somewhere in that time period of the church moving above the butcher shop to the church up on the hill, the mother, Clara, had come to faith in Jesus Christ and been baptized in the Spirit. And gradually she won her daughters to the Lord. But her boy would have nothing to do with it. He was bitter and angry. And one Sunday, the mother said to him, won't you come to church with me today? And he again declined, as he always did. And she said, will you at least walk with me to church today? And he agreed to walk her to church. And when they came to the door of the church, she begged him, won't you please come in? And he went in. He agreed to go in, and he sat on the back row. Pastor Ben Mahan, by that time, was 10 years as pastor of that church. And Ben Mahan preached that morning. And at the close of that service, Ben Mahan gave an invitation for any who would receive Jesus Christ to come and to kneel at the altar. That 16-year-old boy got out of his seat in 1924 and came to the front and knelt at an altar and gave his life to Jesus Christ. His life was instantly transformed. Two weeks later, he received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and he received a call to be a missionary to China and Tibet. I know his story very well because that is the story of my dad who pastored the church at Chestnut and Graham. Several years ago, several years ago I preached at that church. The church has a new building now, but I went back to the old building, which still stands. It's another denomination has it now. Came early in the morning and asked the custodian if I could come in. And I was alone in the building. I knew from photographs I'd seen that the pews that were in the building were the same pews that were there in 1924. My sister was with me. We sat in the back and we talked about our family and the fact that now close to 50 members of our family into the fifth generation from mom and dad, all but three or four are serving Jesus. 
And I said to my sis at one point, you know, I would like to recreate the walk that dad took that changed his life from the back row to the front. Why don't we walk together? As we got out of the back row and began walking to the front of the church, I began to cry uncontrollably. By the time I got to the middle of that aisle, halfway down, I was weeping because something occurred in my heart that I'd never thought of before. And that is that when my dad's life changed, not only was he changed, but everyone coming after him was changed. Everyone coming after him was changed. <clears throat> and so I never met Pastor Ben Mahan, but he was a pastor that literally changed the destiny of our family now for 100 years. God has not forgotten him. I've not forgotten him. <clears throat> and there's going to be a day when you're going to also, on the other side, meet some of the people that are already on the other side who had an impact on your life and your faith. If I ask you, if I ask you, name the last five Super Bowl winners, I doubt that you could. Name the last five Academy Award winners, I doubt that you could. Name the last five World Series winners, I doubt that you could. But if I asked you, name five people that touched your life for Jesus Christ deeply, you could do that. You, or if you can't do that, you could name at least one. And one of the most profound ones you would name would be Pastor Bernice Hicks. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> But beyond that, I pray that there'll be people that will say that of you, that they'll remember the impact that you had upon their life because God remembers your work and someday you will discover that you also, if you have not already discovered it, have touched people you didn't even know you touched. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. Maybe you feel that what you're doing is not all that significant. Maybe you feel it's not all that important. Maybe even at times you're tempted to say, you know what, no one ever notices what I do. Why am I doing what I do? Why am I paying my tithes? Why am I involved in this discipleship group or small group? Why am I serving food? Why am I feeding the poor? Why am I doing what I'm doing? It's so small, no one ever notices. This scripture says, God notices. God notices, and that's enough. And one day, he will say the words we all wait for, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy that has been prepared for you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So let's, uh, let's remember God's deeds in the past. Let's remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And let's, let's also remember that God does not forget us and that God remembers our work for him.